Well, hey guys, my name is Gideon and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship. Uh, and today I'm pumped that I get to, to kick off this brand new series that we've entitled How to Study uh, the Bible. And so our prayer is that it'll give you the tools and uh, the necessary things that you need to be able to study the Bible like never before. And so today in session one is really a simple setting the foundation and the groundwork of what's to come in the following weeks. Uh, so that's really what you can expect for today. And so I'm just really gonna to give you some, some, some facts, some interesting data, but also uh, deconstructing some of the methodology that we might have as we approach studying the Bible. And so my desire and my hope is that uh, the Spirit would continue to lead you and guide you and to stir your heart for more affection of studying and pursuing God by reading His Word. And so with that being said, I'd like to kick off by just reading this passage here, found in 2 Timothy. We've, we all know this. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 16 here. Here's what it reads. All Scripture is breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. If you're a believer, a follower of Jesus, you would affirm this. If you're a Christian, you hold to the belief that the Bible truly is God's word, and all of scripture is God-breathed. Now, what's interesting though, is that while we would affirm that reality, practicality, it kind of looks different, right? If we're honest with ourselves, we tend to have this strange relationship when it comes to the Bible. On the one hand, we believe that the Bible is God's word. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, and so on. Yet on the other hand, though, we don't actually pick it up and read it. We don't really treat it with its valued importance. In fact, this is the best-selling book of all time, and it remains so year after year after year, making it the, the, the best-selling unread book of all time. So why is that? Why do we have this strange relationship with the Bible? Well, it's not because we have a lack of access to the Bible. In fact, research shows that 87% of Americans own a Bible. In the average household, you can find at least four Bibles probably collecting dust somewhere. And of course, with digital technology and the internet and smartphones, anybody can read the Bible in any language, anytime, anywhere. See, we've amassed so many resources to help us learn and to study the Bible and in excessive ways like never before. This study is contributing to that. So here's an alarming reality. We are the most literate society and generation of all of history, yet we are progressively becoming more illiterate when it comes to the things of the Bible. And there's a generation coming up behind us that's the, the most biblically illiterate generation in all of history. In a consortium for research, a recent study shows this data. I'd like to share this with you, right? 60% of Americans can't even name five of the Ten Commandments. It's no wonder that we keep breaking them. At least 12% of adults believe that Joan of Arc was actually Noah's wife. It's crazy. Uh, in the UK, a third of British parents thought that Harry Potter was a thematic plot line that derived from the Bible. How do you get that? You get this, a survey of graduating high school seniors revealed that more than 50% thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were a husband and wife, a couple in the Bible. Talk about a real power couple, right? And consider this, this data point, right? Uh, to the number of respondents to the one poll that indicated that the Sermon on the Mount they believed was preached by none other than Billy Graham himself. Also, according to 82% of Americans, they believe that the phrase, God helps those who helps themselves, is actually a verse in the Bible to which some of you are probably secretly thinking, ah, I knew that, yes, I, I knew that. But listen, our, our problem isn't that we aren't a literate society, we are. Our problem isn't even that we don't have access to the Bible because we do. The number one reason, the number one reason according to research why Americans don't engage in the Bible is because they don't know how it's relevant to their everyday lives. So I live in downtown Miami, where it's heralded as the epicenter of culture, progress, and modernity. How, how does the modern city that I live in, right, that we live in, how does this modern city relate to the ancient world of the Bible? A lot of contemporary Americans will ask, how can this ancient document possibly inform the way that I should live my life and deal with the problems that I have today? Why do I need to know what happened 5,000 years ago to some Israelites in the desert? Like, how does that dictate my future? It's kind of like finding out what's wrong with a brand new car. Instead of looking at your, your car manual, your brand new car manual, you're, you feel like you're looking at a 1950s car manual, right? And we think, how is this gonna help? How is this relevant? We think that understanding the Bible doesn't matter. It's kind of like, 
it's no different than needing to know where my shirt came from, right? Or, or how it's made, or it's just irrelevant. And it happened such a long time ago. But think about this. It's kind of like putting a jigsaw puzzle together, right? Have you ever done one of those thousand piece jigsaw puzzles from scenery or nature somewhere? It's difficult. And it's, 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 it can be daunting to look at a thousand pieces laid out on a table like this. Now imagine doing that jigsaw puzzle and putting it together without a picture as a reference. It's nearly impossible. You will look at these individual pieces and you're thinking to yourself, how can I even fathom how to connect these pieces together? How does this piece of trees over here connect with this piece of rock somewhere? And that's exactly our approach when it comes to how we feel about the Bible, because we don't know the context or the perspective of what's going on in the Bible. We can't piece it together. But if we saw the final piece, if we referenced the bigger picture and had a methodology and a process and the tools necessary, we could actually piece it together and start to make sense of it. And get this, it starts becoming relevant to us. And I know it's not, it's not going to be easy. At the end of the day, a, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle is still a thousand pieces that you have to put together to understand the Bible. It takes work. And listen, it takes hard work. You need to know that it takes hard work because if you don't believe that, we could be tempted to think that, that understanding the Bible is only reserved for smart people. It can only be understood by enlightened people or people with PhDs or degrees in Bible and theology. Listen, it's, it's hard work, but it's worth it and it's satisfying in the end. After all, if this is the primary way that God speaks to us and reveals himself to us, isn't it worth the effort to explore it, to explore what it says? Take for instance this imagery, right, of raking and digging. See, there, there are two kinds of practices that you should have rhythms for in your life. One is reading the Bible and the other is studying the Bible. There's a difference. Reading the Bible is a lot like raking leaves, right? You can get it done fairly quickly. It's not gonna require a lot of work. And, and what you're, you're going to collect is just on the surface, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually a good rhythm that you should have in your life. But studying the Bible is a lot more like digging. It will require more time and more effort. And if you dig long enough, you will find that treasure that you're looking for. You'll find that nugget of truth. It will also require that you use a different set of tools. That's why we're creating this study to give you the tools necessary to study the Bible. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list or, or even a superior methodology of how to study the Bible, but it's a good start and a helpful way to begin a, our journey in studying the Bible together. Now, before we share how to actually study the Bible and the process of what that looks like in the coming weeks, it's important for us to understand the wrong approaches to the Bible. See, in order to construct a methodology for studying the Bible, we first need to deconstruct the unhealthy approaches of studying the Bible. In fact, author Jen Wilkin offers some suggestions of unhealthy approaches to study the Bible. Let's take a look at some of these, right? The first approach that's unhealthy is what's known as the Xanax approach. Now, Xanax is the go-to kind of drug for people who, who feel anxious, and they take it to make them feel better. So in this approach, we, we treat the Bible as if it exists to make us feel better looking for encouraging passages and reassuring verses to calm our anxious hearts. Nothing wrong with that. But the problem with this approach is that it makes the Bible to be about me. And we ask the Bible, how can it serve me? And, and how can it serve my needs rather than serve the God of the Bible? And as a result, we'll only read parts of the Bible and leave tons unread because it doesn't comfort us, but challenges us. Then there's the, the pinball approach, right? This is the unguided process where we read whatever text, what kind we kind of flip to, and, and we just let the Holy Spirit speak to whatever page you turn to, right? The problem with this approach, though, is that the Bible isn't meant to be read that way. Similar to this approach is the A-ball approach, right? Do you remember that toy or that device as a kid? It's, the, it's a, this toy that's shaped like a large eight ball. And what you would do is you would ask it a certain question, uh, like, will I pass this test or will I get that promotion? And then you would shake up the eight ball and it would give you this generic response, right? You would ask this question, does she like me? You would shake it, not a chance, pal. Well, it's a tough time, right? But, but this magic eight ball, this magic eight ball is like an approach of asking the Bible a question and expecting random verses to answer it for you. For example, there's this story of, of a man who, who wanted to find out what God's future was for him. What was God's will for his life? And so he closed his eyes and he opened up his Bible and he randomly stuck his finger on a piece of page of the Bible. And when he opened his eyes, he would read it. He landed on Matthew chapter 27, verse five, which said, Judas went away and hanged himself. 
well, the guy didn't like that. He's like, no, I don't like that. And so he flipped the page and, and he stuck his finger on another page of the Bible and his finger landed on Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 37, which said, go and do likewise. Again, the guy doesn't like this. So he flips the page randomly again and he, he puts his finger on a passage of scripture and it lands on John chapter 13, verse 27, which is whatever you do, do it quickly. I see the problem with this approach is that you look at the Bible as a magical book of incantations where we look at the Bible to tell us what to do rather than who to be. We should look at studying the Bible as a deposit, not always as a withdrawal. You see, when you go to an ATM machine and you, you have to withdraw money, you take money out of the ATM, right? But when you want to invest money into a bank account, you would deposit that money into the account. And, and think about the Bible that way, rather than thinking about it as a, as a magic eight ball approach or, or just looking at the Bible for its withdrawals and, and stuff that you need right at that moment. Study the Bible. Study the Bible like you're depositing it into a spiritual bank account. You might not need it right now, but what you're doing is hiding God's word in your heart, abiding in Christ that you can bear much fruit. The other bad approach that we have to studying the Bible that Wilkins mentions, and actually I see this a lot, is the personal shopper approach where I want to know more about how to be a godly person and how to deal with temptations and, and all these issues that I'm facing or what's God's will for my life. But we don't know where to find these verses. So you know what we do? We go look for it, but not through the Bible. We, we go look through it through, insert your famous Bible teacher, and then we let them do the legwork for me. And of course, the, the, the problem with this approach is that we don't allow God to speak to us himself. We don't take ownership of the scriptures. It's kind of like eating chewed up food. I know it's gross, but you, you allow another person to do all of the hard work for you by breaking down your food, chewing your food, yes, gross, and then you finally just swallow it. But that's the truth here. We just want the, the microwave answers, right? We're not allowing them to, to marinate and to stew in us. And what happens is that we never get those aha moments that God wants to bring in our lives. You know, the, the world before Google was very frustrating. Before Google, you would watch a movie and you would think to yourself, where have I seen this actor before? He looks very familiar. Where have I seen him before? But you didn't have the, the means to research or find out right away. And so that's the microwave approach. And so what you would have to do is just wallow in your misery, not knowing this guy, right? And then finally, a week later in the shower, it finally hits you. And so it goes with the scripture. You, you might be reading something you don't know what it means right at the moment. And rather than going straight to a commentary or researching the answers, you instead allow yourself to meditate on the passage of scripture. You dwell on the text, and after wrestling with the text, God gives you that aha moment. And here's what happens. You'll never forget that verse ever again, or the meaning of that verse. And you'll actually experience that verse in a whole new way. And that's what we want you to experience. Another bad approach to studying the Bible is known as the telephone game approach, right? As a kid, we played the telephone game. We would whisper a sentence in one person's ear and it would go around and just like the telephone game approach, we're actually not hearing it from the original source. We're hearing it from another source, from other sources. So we read the Bible or actually we, we read stuff about the Bible, but we don't actually read the Bible itself. The problem of course is that we are called to love the Lord our God with our minds and not our, our pastor's mind or not our small group leader's minds. And the, the tragic irony here is that we would go through a study like this called How to Study the Bible and not actually read or study the Bible. It would be tragic, tragic irony. Another bad approach is known as the, the Thomas Jefferson approach. He was the third president of the United States and he was a deist, he was a naturalist. He didn't believe in any of the supernatural parts of or the claims of the Bible, like the miracles. So you know what he would do is he would take the Bible and he took a sharp razor and he took out all of the verses that he didn't like. And that's kind of like the approach that we, we would do if, if we avoided parts of the Bible that we don't like, right? So we'll read the New Testament because we love the New Testament, but we avoid the Old Testament. Uh, but we'll read the Psalms or we'll read the Proverbs there, but not those obscure passages and laws that we don't like. Again, the problem is that all scripture is God-breathed. It is profitable, all of it. Now, the last unhealthy approach of reading the Bible is when we read it through a secular eyes or a secular lens. So it can kind of manifest itself in, in two ways. One is that we'll read the Bible, but we won't read it for us. We read it for someone else. So maybe for you, you're preparing a, a message or a small group lesson or studying for someone else. And we don't allow the Bible to speak to us. The other way that this kind of manifests itself is when we read the Bible, 
Uh, we study the Bible without asking the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We don't pray. We just go straight for the information rather than transformation. And so here's what we need to do. Before studying the Bible, before we approach the scriptures, we should ask God, pray to God that he guides us. Maybe there's a sin in my life that's causing me to not see what your truth is. Maybe it's just me, or maybe I just need wisdom and guidance. You know, James chapter, chapter one, verse five tells us this, that if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to you without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So as we begin this journey of studying the Bible, why don't we start there? Why don't we start there by, by praying and asking the guidance of the Holy Spirit and asking him that he would help us as we study his word.